I just gotta make sure I make it too long. But it's kind of long. <laughs> oh God. Okay. Ezekiel twenty five seventeen. The path to the righteous painter is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil miniature companies. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost miniatures. And I will strike down thee with great vengeance and furious anger, those who attempt to poison and destroy my miniatures. And you will know my podcast is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. On Trapped Under Plastic, the podcast where mostly grown men use plastic figures instead of a coloring book and act all serious about it. That's really hard to try to do it like Sam Jackson and read it. Is I I have about like seventy five percent of that memorized, but I, I knew I'd fuck it up. <laughs> and also ad lib the different words that were related to miniature painting. All right. Well, thank you for the Bible verse. It was lovely to start this Bible study. Everyone, how you doing this week? We're gonna go around in a circle. <laughs> you know, that's not a re- for the longest time I didn't realize that's not a real Bible verse. I did not know that. Actually. Tarantino wrote that. Okay. Uh, to make, it, but it sure sell sell sounds like one, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it does sound like an Old Testament Bible verse for it, sure. You know what that movie is from, right? Pulp Fiction. Yes. I know what that movie is from. Yeah, you know what that movie is from. Yeah, yeah. You know, movie that's from. Yeah, yeah. That's Pulp Fiction. I've seen that one once or twice. That's a good one. God, say what again? What? Say what one more goddamn time. <laughs> All right, you have like 17,000. Sorry. Okay. So why don't you go first? I only had two, and then- uh, It grows. It grows. And why it grew has to do with the first preamble ramble topic. This is called Podcast on the Drive. For the first like year and a half, two years of this podcast, every time I drew, drove up here for the podcast, I listened to the previous episode on the drive, yeah. which they roughly equated. The, I could listen to one episode, maybe not the entire episode, on the drive up. And that kind of like got me in the, the mood, the juices flowing, whatever, for it. And it also meant that I actually listened to our podcast. And I just, over the last year or so, maybe a little longer, I haven't been doing that. Mm. And this morning I did it again. And what does it, it do for you? Like I'm, it legit like gets me ready to record it gets me ready to, to do this like i'm in the mindset i'm remembering like what we do it was a good thing because <laughs> i forget <laughs> <laughs> i think even your drive i, I don't know you i don't know if your 87 honda can play your podcast but <laughs> do you have like the cd player where you put the the, the hook cd it into, player hook, uh, it, hook it into the tape deck with a cord and then it allows you to play cd my my <laughs> it's okay brief segue my my uh car is so ancient I went to do Target pickup. I never do Target pickup, but Amber bought something for Target pickup, and I went there. And the fucking Zoomer who came to bring my food, I had to crank my window down. The first thing this lady says to me, and she's like 16, she's like, "How old is your car?" And I was like, "Fuck, man, I'm getting roasted by Target employees right now." Anyways, no, there is no tape deck in my Honda. There is no way for me to listen to modern media on my car. Oh, I could do like the radio thing. It's like a radio thing, right? Where you like yeah. tune into this channel. Yes, yeah. and it plays whatever zone. I could do that, but I, why bother? It's too much hassle. I mean, you can put in like uh, one one earbud. Yeah. And play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could do that. You know, I mean, there's there's ways. So it's uh, anyway. Um, that was uh, reminded me of of this, and I got to listen to your uh, "I Want to Rock" again intro from the last episode, <laughs> and it really really reminded me how bummed I was that I didn't do the background rhythm. Uh, for that intro, but next time you did the background vocals. I did the background vocals, but not the rhythm. The dun 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 dun. dun. Okay, now I want to sing again. Yeah, um, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, next thing. Poots talk. Poots. Poots. Adam Poots. Um, Adam Poots reached out to me. He he's the creator of Kingdom Death, the uh, creative mind around all things Kingdom Death, and uh, he reached out to me. Uh, after I had done my video where I painted his crimson crocodile. And he's like, I didn't know that you played our game. And he's like, I watch your videos. And uh, he's like, we should chat sometime. And I'm like, wow, this is fucking surreal. Because he's kind of like a, you know, a monolithic uh, personality in in the hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, it's such a unique take in the things that, that they have done with that game um, to really 
catapulted beyond more than just a board game, right? And the people that are fans are, are passionate fans. I'd never met the guy, never talked to him before, and we chatted, and it, oh God, it ended up being like over two hours. He's way more down to earth than just a funny dude. Um, we are the same age, and we were born in the same month. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> right? And I think there was part of that. Like halfway through the conversation, we figured that out, and we have kids about the same age. Um, just like a lot of things he talked about were very relatable. He's a very nice guy, very interesting guy. Uh, a lot of fun and a lot of like he just you can tell his brain works differently like the things he would like ideas or like crazy things that he would just say I'm like oh you're just always thinking way out in left field and then finding a way to make a, a palatable reality version of the crazy idea and that's just kind of how his brain works and I was just like really really cool um, he's a fan of our channel he's a fan of your stuff he listens to your stuff when he sits home in hobbies and stuff. So nice. I was just like, I was really cool. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to tell people on podcasts that I got to talk with you. And he's that's like, cool. That's cool. You know? So it was, it was really cool. So yeah, glad to hear that. Don Earth, <clears throat> it's cool to, I'd be cool to meet him too. Yeah. Um, all right. We, Shall I go with one of mine? Yeah. Let's see what you say. Okay. Before I played uh, my first game of Star Wars Shadow Point, the extent to which I enjoyed Star Wars media was. That, that I'd watched the movies. I'd watched the original three a lot. I'd watched the prequels less. And I watched the newest movies even less than that. Like like once or twice for the newest ones. So that was like that was my Star Wars interest levels. Which to me to me that's like your average Star Wars fan. They like the movies and that's pretty much it, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I am in the same boat. Okay, you've you. seen all them all nine of them all eleven of the movies, whatever there is. Yeah. Not including the caravan one. Um, so I played Shatterpoint, and the first time I played Shatterpoint, or the first time I saw the Jedi Hunter's box, was when I realized that there were such a thing in the universe as an Inquisitor that hunts Jedi. I was like, that's a really cool concept. Yep. And I was like, what else is going on in this universe that I don't know about? And so I've watched like so many TV shows. Like I, I just finished Ahsoka because that wrapped up this week, and... Star Wars has never been cooler than right now, at, really? at least visually. Um, like, there are, like, at least in Ahsoka, like, there's some fucking visually mean and awesome shit going on in oh. in the world. Like, Star Wars has a certain degree of campiness to it, as I'm sure you're familiar with, yes. right? There's yes. a little bit of comedy. Um, but uh, in that TV show, like, it gets super dark and super, it's really cool looking. Um and like beyond that, there's like awesome comics that I've like tried to uh, not try out of added to my Amazon wish list that I'm excited to read, like about like just Darth Vader, about uh, Darth Maul, and like the planet he comes from Dathomir, but like there's this whole expanded universe outside of the films that is like really, really captivating. I've been playing Jedi Fallen uh, Order. I saw you on Steam. Yeah, yeah dude. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, I was like, oh, Scotty's playing some some Star Wars Wars. Yeah. That's when you, I saw this on the thing. I was like, oh, yeah, I saw you playing a Star Wars video game. You know? <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> yeah, so and like that uh, that video game inspired some conversions on these Inquisitors. Wow. Um, but uh, I'm having just a lot of fun with Star Wars, and uh, I can't wait to get my, my grubby mitts on more content to watch and play. Uh, I actually want to eventually get an actual comic book so I can, I can read it instead of just adding it to my Amazon wish list. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with uh, Star Wars right now. And I, I'm realizing something that's changing about the way I enjoy the hobby, um, at least for right now. Obviously, things can change at, at all times. But what I, what I get immense satisfaction out of right now is, like, painting an army for a game and putting my unique twist on it. And, like, just that, that whole process mm -hmm. is just very exciting. Like, the whole process of painting these Inquisitors, consuming Star Wars media, making custom decals, experimenting with painting processes, like, doing, like, a weird a weird base, and just, like, and painting them in an off scheme, like, and just that whole process, and, like, what I'm thinking about it and how I'm relating to it is so much fun, and I just want to keep doing it. I just want to paint another army, another war band, and go through that same process, because it's just so, it's so satisfying. Um, I don't know what it's satisfying about it, but I have almost a completed Shatterpoint Force. It's only six models. It's, so, it's such a small army. I need Darth Vader and a Stormtrooper Sergeant, and then I'm done. Wow. But yeah, it's just like that. the the whole process of getting sucked into a world and really enjoying it and then making a game or making a warband uh, something of your own 
uh, after being inspired by all that media, it's just so much fun. It's there's something so much fun about that. And I find myself not necessarily caring about painting a display model. Like I don't care just about the painting process. Mm. I also care about like all of those other things that are contributing to the experience. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. I, I feel guilty saying that cause I feel like a lot of my background is in display painting. I don't want to like just run away from that. I'm not running away from it. Uh, and just, but just right now in this moment, I'm really enjoying that kind of hobby. Well, I think that that's not too far removed in the, the part that it's like directing you or, or inspiring you for this is not unlike the times when you or you're inspired to paint for display because you're going off of a, a a, a story or something you've come up with in your head or yeah. your vision of a thing and it's kind of a similar track is what you're doing here your inspiration may come more external and then you're putting your own vision on what that would look like so i don't think they're that far removed right um you're right you're, you honestly you're right and when you say that i realize that now most of the miniature display models that i've painted that have i have the most memory of I've like created the most like like background story for mm -hmm. and like or the background story really inspired the paint direction like on the pizza boy I really look fondly on that model and it was because the idea for the paint job like he's from Brooklyn he's, he's a pizza delivery boy he's in a comic book that like came through so hardcore in the paint job um, and so like when that happens it's like a just it's just a lot more fun to paint and makes me want you to not just paint a, a single figure on a base for a competition because I feel like that is the version of it that yeah is, is strictly just asks everything of you with very little of your own creative vision yeah you know you're totally you're totally right yeah and that that's kind of weird too is um I guess I kind of did that in my my first golden demon with the the grotesque was well it was a conversion it was a yeah trying to tell the story of him in this in the underhive kind of like running through the sewer thing just looking for a victim and you had like a harsh light like it's a spotlight in that yeah. sewer so you, so you can do it with a single figure I yeah think. you can it's just a little bit it feels a little bit less yeah. comes through less but like I found like more of my stuff my stuff from last my diorama for last year my piece I'm planning for this year. As much as I don't want to like paint a ton of fucking models for one piece, it's like I find myself doing it again because it's the exciting thing mm. of like this vision yeah. of, of I, an idea and then trying to solve the the equation to make it a reality. Right, and that's the gas that gets you through a paint job. Yes. So it's, it's important to chase that kind of that kind of feeling for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what else did I have here? Um, Some golden demon category changes. Okay. Some yeah. And. <clears throat> Speaking of Golden Demon, I officially have started my Golden Demon work Gosh. this week. Um, I've shared some of, of that with you and the, the rest of the uh, triumvirate, uh, <laughs> as I will refer to them. Um, and I'm asking for, for help from um, certain secretive uh, men of mystery. <laughs> international <laughs> men of mystery. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> truly international <laughs> men of mystery uh, for some help on things that I know that I need help on and things that I've failed on in the past. And to just get a little bit of like confidence and direction um, with things. And um, I haven't started painting anything yet because I've learned that uh, <laughs> you can make big mistakes before you ever pick up a paintbrush. Or you can set yourself up for a more difficult time or more up for success. And so Golden Demon has kind of been in my mind. And a part of that was the announcement of the categories of Golden Demon 2024 which was just a couple of weeks ago they announced these and there's been a big hubbub a big hullabaloo <laughs> about this and yes we could talk about it in the news but i thought it was kind of connected to this preamble ramble discussion um did you did you check out the the category changes at all yeah yeah i, I mean i and i've seen like uh, you and others and vince discussing it in our chat like the merits of the categories um, and we discussed it in a voice chat earlier this week, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I don't know all of them, but I'm aware of some of the biggest offenders. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I will say if you want to. Why, why don't you describe it for the viewers? Sure. We'll do. We'll get into that. But I'll, I'll preface that by saying if you want a more in-depth, really thorough breakdown of all of this, check out the Cult of Paint 
YouTube channel. They did a, a full video where they have like their podcast squad where there's the four of them um, that are together and they really break it down and give their thoughts and they don't pull any punches. Is the Golden Demon guy there? Golden Demon guy? The guy who runs oh, the Matt? De- yeah, Matt C- Compendium. Guy. Yes, Matt's on there. Cool, yeah. If he's on there as well, he's going to get all the facts straight too. Yeah, so that's so going to be good. They have a good foursome there that, that run that. Um, I'm glad they don't pull any punches. Sometimes I feel like British people are a little afraid to criticize yeah. GW. Yeah. And so I love to hear that. I, I, Yeah, I like that when they hit a topic that they're passionate about, which is typically around Golden Demon, that's kind of their, their thing. Um but other things around Games Workshop, particularly, they are they're they're pretty tenacious, respectful as any good tea drinker would be, <laughs> but 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 still not shying away from it. Um, okay, so some of the big things are they've expanded the number of categories by quite a bit. Where like Necromunda has its own category now, Warhammer Underworlds has its own category now, Blood Bowl has its own category now, Horus Heresy, Horus Heresy has its own category now. And in other areas, they've combined them. So, like, where it used to be vehicle 40K and large model 40K, it is now one. So now you have to judge a giant tank next to a big Magnus the Red. Yeah. Which is like trying to compare an apple and an orange. Um, Totally different skill set, totally different kinds of techniques how do you say one is I mean, you can say overall the overall execution and everything you can compare any two models there but when both are painted very well or both are painted at 8.5 out of 10 you can't compare them to find those deciding factors yeah honestly like it's already difficult enough to compare miniatures and like have some kind of quantified outcome like this one is better than this one Mm -hmm. (laughs) when they're the same fucking category of model let alone in golden demon especially because of how many entries there are yeah let alone having a giant fucking walker compared to a tank or like a big model from blood bowl compared to a small model model from blood bowl it's just like like what this screams to me is the winners of every category are trending toward like whatever one just screams Warhammer the loudest or screams that particular IP the loudest yes. and is like the coolest representation of that IP, whatever that means to the judges. Yeah. I mean, you can still do things, I think, to self set yourself course, up yes. for success. Absolutely, yes. Um, but just be wary of it not screaming Warhammer enough. Right. With IP defined categories, it feels like it's like even a little bit even more important now yeah. than it was in the past. So the 40K vehicle plus large model it thing is an issue. Um, yeah, that, that's probably like one of the biggest glaring issues. Oh, or is heresy. Yeah. So you have all the Primarchs, yep. which uh, thank God that they I, I overall happy that they moved Horus Heresy apart because I'm so sick of just Primarchs winning the 40k single all the time. It's like <laughs> they're not even fucking 40k models, and like it's just it got all samey same. It became where like if you were really wanting to win a demon and go full ball sack on a piece. You like you flipped a coin. One side of the coin was the latest, coolest uh, Space Marine hero. The other side of the coin was a Primark. Those were the two things you painted, and those what will always win. And so to pull them out, it felt good. It feels like we have more breathing room, maybe in forty k single. I think that's a good thing. But then you get into in the Horus Heresy category because none of the other rules are defined. They don't give any details. On like base like size, no, and... they just had a fucking visual chart of the categories, but they don't explain anything. So, we are right now in the fall for Adepticon in the end of March. People that are painting for that competition have already started or will be starting yeah. soon. Yeah, probably many people, if you're doing multiple pieces, they may have a piece and a half done already, and now. You may not even fit into the category you thought you were in. Or what if you did a unit category where half of the models in your unit were from Underworlds and half of them were from AOS? Now what the fuck do you do? Because like you don't qualify for either category now. Yeah. But back to Horse Heresy. So you have Primarchs. You have the new giant Fulgrim, dude. You have... Well, that one's a 40K model. No, that's 30K. 
Or sorry, not Fulgrim. Uh, wait, Ma- so the big Magnus the Red model, that would be a 40K large model, right? That's, that's that would not 40K go- large. <laughs> okay. But the new- f- Do you see how this is funny? Yeah, the new Fulgrim <laughs> Slanesh dude, that's 30K. All the big tanks and like the, the Titans and any of those big vehicles and all those things, that's all 30K. Unit of Mark V, Mark Seven Space Marines, that's 30K. All the Dreadnoughts, the like Leviathan Dreadnought, the Dorito, Dorito Dreadnought, all Dor- those, Dorito. That, that's all 30K. So you can have the the entire range of sci-fi spectrum. <laughs> 32 mil all the way up to 120 mil. Yeah. In one category. <laughs> How the fuck is that going to work? Who fucking knows? Who fucking knows? So th- there's the spread out, and we talked about some of the combining. Another big thing that they combined, which I think this might be might be the most egregious is they combine diorama and duel into one category <laughs> yeah yeah and so basically what that means is we are going to see a trend and i don't know which way it'll go i think it's gonna go toward diorama um and the other one will die yeah yeah like yeah. duo won't exist anymore it will just be diorama because in an arms race, a diorama is just much more grand in theory. I mean, who knows based on past winners if that's true or not. But <laughs> grandeur counts for something. Yeah. And so it's almost like at, at the same level, again, we talk about if they were both nines out of tens, the diorama will win. Yes. Yes. We can't ignore the fact that technical execution does matter. And it yes. is easier to technically execute on a piece that has true. less physical models. But if given... As much time as you need and equal quality levels, Diorama is always going to win. Always. Right. So that, that that is like on paper. I, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Happen. You know, I had actually had a duel planned, uh, sketched out. I have the models <laughs> figured out, the conversions and everything, and I just scrapped it. I'm just not going to do it. Because, At all? No. Can you tell us what it was? What was the duel? Yeah, it was two... Um, it was the Age of Sigmar duel. There's n- they're both newer models, which I think is cool. Is uh, there's new versions of the Iron Jaws, where there is one of the they, there's ones where they have these big weapons, but they're kind of bigger armor. There's one dude in there that he is leaping, like off of something off a tactical rock or something. So he's like a great leaping pose with a big two handed club over his head. And I was probably gonna switch the weapon, but just but he's also kind of open to the camera right so like if you're if you're watching a play if you're watching a a play you'll notice that people never look directly at each other they're always open to the audience so they're kind of they're they're facing you while they're facing each other it's kind of like how we're sitting here we're not facing just each other we're facing the camera right you need to have your eyes open so you need it's really important when you're doing a dual piece that both models have that kind of a pose yeah kind of like leaning maybe toward the center with the open body yeah Yeah. so you have action Mm -hmm. but the action is also figures are open so he's got that great action pose nice and then the uh, so he's going to be lunging jumping towards each other and the other ones was these new just announced i don't think they're out yet a war cry war band for the maw eater ogres where they kind of we thought they were flesh eater courts because they're really pa- painted really pale okay and they're like big ogres and there's a couple of them that are just really nasty like snarling mouth open like horrifying faces and there's one that's open would be facing the way his pose facing towards the guy that's leaping at him and he's kind of looking up with his arms out like this uh. like he's ready to, and he's like screaming like they're both battle cry screaming and there's like he's ready for him to lunge on him nice and so i was super excited they worked so well um, i was going to change out the head because the of the the ogre dude because that model it has like a blindfold on it must be part of a story or something that it's bl- there that one is blind or something i don't know but i just think that's weird but there's another head in that kit that's also got a big scary nasty screaming face that has eyes so yeah have a, i feel like having the full face to work with also is pretty nice for yes. making a good looking miniature as well yeah so that was that was it and so i am i'm focusing instead on a different my different piece which is which is smart anyway there's no way i would complete be able to complete both of those pieces yeah but anyway so okay that's that's the big stuff with with that. Um, we'll see because they didn't even guarantee that that was all the categories that are going to be for all of 2024. Meaning, 
that that may just be the categories for Adepticon. They may change it again. My big takeaway is this is this whole screams that these decisions were made by marketing, that these were made by trying to pedestalize your different IPs to sell or bring more attention to yeah. your certain other games. Yeah. It, it's about highlighting your game systems and not about creating categories that make a good painting competition. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like GW has grown too quickly in the last three years. And I feel like a universal truth about companies that grow too quickly is there's no way if they want to add additional things to control and additional employees to manage, there's no way they're going to do their jobs well. Right. Right. Like you need to grow at a speed at which you can have retrospective and, and moderate that growth so that you know everyone's doing their job there. It's going in the direction that you want your company to go in. Like if you make like a bazillion dollars and that's like five times as much as you made the previous year and you just hire a bunch of employees and you're like, wait, I need to think about quality assurance and like all these other things. It's just like, that's so hard to do yeah. correctly. Yeah. And so I feel like they grew so fast and they're just making a bunch of choices about things because they're just kind of flying under the radar. It's like, there's no way they're going to control us all correctly. There are people there at the companies that want to control that IP or sorry, control those things and, and do good jobs with golden demon and with, with other things, but it's hard to get everyone in the right place doing the right thing. Um, it, I think particularly stuff around golden demon is particularly frustrating to us one, because we're all passionate hobby members, but two, because we know whether, how much you know, the intricacies of, of games workshop and staff and departments, whether you know that or not, I think in your gut, you probably weren't surprised to hear that they have the passionate, creative people in those buildings established already that love really the, the side of the hobby, the creation, the painting, the sculpting, the events like Golden Demon. Those people are already in-house and they are, they are invested with years in your company and they are not utilizing those people. I think yeah. that's pretty apparent. Yeah. And they're they're in a tough spot when just like you're you're exactly right they have grown they have been forced to grow very fast because of their own success in an ideal world is incremental growth your gro your company is already always incrementally changing and trying to improve but it's in small areas where your pillars will always be there and that you're always trying to tweak and improve um one bit at a time and here it's just like well they don't have the luxury of that they have to or they feel they have to make big changes um, to keep those, I don't know, shareholders happy. I don't know. Yeah, they're not forced to grow. Like they're the ones who like sold the stuff to make them more money, than, and then chose to invest it and stuff like that. I, yeah. I feel like there's definitely a point where they could be like, you know, what, we're just gonna make the same amount of money we made last year, or like ten percent more. Yeah, not like seventeen thousand percent more. Well, yeah, I mean, you can still, you could still deal with that growth in a way that is just like okay what we're going to do is we're going to up the amount of um sculptors we have on staff we're going to up the amount of models that we're releasing we can up the amount of i'm sure that was part of it heavy metal painters we have so we can get all the paint jobs done on time like yeah you could do all that you can just take what you've done and grow the the quantity of it yeah and they've done that i'm sure yeah that's what happened that but it's all these other things it's, that is it's almost like justifying their existence, right? It's the new things. It's like the it's the uh, it's the behind the scenes content they're filming for uh, Warmer Plus. It's their it's their YouTube channel. It's the, it's these avenues that are new and not like their core business model, which is making models, painting them, making games, and selling that stuff. Like they've been doing that forever, so surely they have a great pipeline for that. But the new things they don't have great pipelines for the new responsibilities they're adding on to their staff, they're hiring people for. Those are the things that are just like probably not manage as well when like a lot of growth is happening i would guess i have no idea yeah it's, we're all, all flying by the seat of our pants all right let's transition transition oh, um to something exciting i got a big box down here scott a big box are we doing this now are we are i we, figured as good as time as any unless you want to do it as a later um i thought that the new segment i thought we were adding later on oh okay yeah we'll, we'll put this as part of the new segment You're or right. the, did you want to eat the thing now or you want to talk about the, the no, thing? no 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 oh, uh, i'll we'll preface it to say we've got a i've got a big box of goodies that come 
um, from the, the faraway land of Hawaii Ooh. by a wonderful friend of the show, Freder Kem. So thank you, Kem. This is kind of a, it was like an anniversary gift because he sent us oh. one similar time last year and it, we sent us a nice little note, That's but so we'll nice. get into that later. Freder is so nice. He always comments on all my uh, Facebook posts on the, the Miniac Facebook page uh, saying nice things. So I appreciate him. He's just a sweet man. Sweet man. All right. What we painted, I believe, is the next thing we'll get into. What did you paint, Scott? I uh, so I in the last couple of days I've been writing my script for my Ranger Masterclass course, or I've been finishing it rather. Currently at thirty-one pages, kill me. Um, and so there are parts of the model that I, <laughs> because I was in a rush to finish that Kickstarter campaign, I did not film well. I filmed, and eighty percent of the footage was blocked by my fucking glasses or my fucking head. And I, I hate it when I do this. I hate it when I rush and I waste my time. It's such a painful lesson to learn. But uh, for the sake of actually having a lot of very good content to film, I repainted the face, the antlers, and the uh, jerkin or the uh, yeah the, the leather vest thing. Mm, beef jerkin. Jerkin. Um, they're not. They weren't super challenging to do. Um, but now I have much better footage of all those processes and uh, have their sections for the script written. So that that has been repainted, sadly. Mm. I like how you have his torso just in a separate piece on here. It <laughs> yeah. It looks so satisfying to just paint without the style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It did, it did make painting and displaying it uh, much easier. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's it, it's, not, it's not a whole lot to say about that. It's not very impressive. It's just like parts of the model. Yeah, that's a good-looking jerkin. Thank you. Are you painting anything else? I see some Star Wars dudes. Yes, I painted three Inquisitors um, with uh, the Grandmaster Inquisitor as my leading uh, like North Star model. Um, each of these models was under an hour of active painting time. That means that I'm not counting cleaning my airbrush, putting paint on my palette. Like when I start the timer is like seconds before I actually start putting paint on the on the model. Um, so they were all in this like kind of 50 minute to one hour time period, um, not including the decals and bases. OK, so that also contributes to the visual experience. Um, so I want to be very clear about like what I'm actually timing. Um, but uh, I had a lot of fun. Uh, the one you're holding that's in the right. Uh, this guy. That's the fifth brother. I put a different head on. That's one I painted with oil paints partially. So I started with an airbrush undercoat, and then I tried to increase the blending on some of the panels with uh, Payne's Gray oil paint and titanium white oil paint, um, and learned some lessons that I want to talk about in the extended version of the of the podcast. Okay. But it was a very, and then I then I let it dry. Um, by the way, some people uh, crit criticized my use of a UV chamber, and I think rightly so because all paints have a light fastness rating, meaning that. In UV light, they degrade in quality, uh, saturation, and brightness. And me essentially putting it in a sun chamber for four hours might not have been a great idea for honestly any kind of paint, both acrylic and uh, oil, but uh, probably especially oil when it's that fresh and, and new. So I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I should have thought of a different way to expedite the curing process. Probably with like additives, right? There's an additive. What's the additive you add to oil paint? Um, yeah, there's one that increases the drying time it might be gambasol yeah that sounds right gambasol and the other thing people do is when you're using like artist grade oil paint they'll put the paint on cardboard to absorb the oil yep because what i understand is ab abtylone comes with less oil in it yes right yep. and so because of that it dries faster so that plus the gambasol probably would have solved at least some of my problems yeah i it just reminded me that you said that when i'm kind of going through my storage area in my storage room um my house just yesterday to kind of reorganize some things and find some new space because the hobby stuff just keeps piling up. Yeah. And I have a giant stack that I had cut of rectangles of cardboard. And I'm like, why the fuck do I have like 20 rectangles of cardboard? Why did I cut those again? <laughs> oh yeah. It was for oil painting <laughs> <laughs> to put the oils on there. Um, it's where they sit. Yeah. So they're just not like sitting in their own juices. It sucks up the juices. Okay. You know, so yeah, it, it absolutely it absolutely makes a difference too in the yeah during time. I, like if it can dry overnight, like that that's good enough for me. Like that's all I really wanted to do. Like if, it, if it's multiple days, then it becomes problematic. That's the fifth brother. That was the oil experiment. Um, 
uh, Riva over here, the third sister, um, I gave her a different head uh, of a I, different Inquisitor. I do like this head when you s showed it. Is this a, the same yeah, scale? You shit on my head, bro. Is, is, you, is this the no. same scale, or do you use a smaller one? I, you see, I ripped I, Yeah, you guys, I think when I asked if it was too big, you said it was a little too big, I think. But I, I ripped it off and put a smaller one on. Okay, yeah. And this one feels a little bit smaller, and it feels perfect. Yeah, yeah. And it, honestly, that was the right call to make. Um, she doesn't look like a bobblehead anymore. It's kind of hard to tell when you've got like a gray plastic model yeah. and then like a gray resin when there's not color on them sometimes I'm, I'm not I'm less confident in this if the scale is right just because there's not paint on it yet I'm like well if you painted it all the way I'd be able to tell you I was like well, doesn't <laughs> fucking help me <laughs> doesn't help me but yes I think this is good and the helmet looks way cooler with the model fully painted. Too. Oh yeah, it looks this one in particular. This, this was the longest paint job. This was like an hour and ten seconds or whatever the fuck. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, this one I'm very happy with. Um, and I painted it in this in my signature, in incredibly hard to describe painting style where I'm just doing whatever the fuck I want to do, uh, <laughs> and it turns out looking okay. Um, it's the very, old the old back seas fourth. Seas. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just gonna keep. Working on this armor panel until it's good enough. Yeah. I'm gonna do a million different techniques with a million different dilutions of paint, and it's gonna be impossible to follow. Yeah. Ready to go. <laughs> because I don't know what I'm gonna do with the next yeah. brush stroke yeah. stroke. So how could I possibly explain it to you? Yeah. And as somebody that went have gotten to that point as well with my own painting, I greatly respect it. I also understand the frustration and confusion <laughs> trying to explain it yeah one trying to explain it and two being an audience person yeah <laughs> being like what why yeah. how why did you do it there why not there and what yeah. and it's like you man i'm all there, over then you moved over there and it's just like wait why'd you move it's like i just moved because I, I i just wanted to move <laughs> like, yeah yeah and, and then by doing that then it made me reevaluate this over here exactly and then uh sometimes i do that I, i'll actually i wrote this in the script because i was thinking about it lately I, i'll start on a part not know how to fix a problem on that part and then move somewhere else so I can think about that part while I paint an easier thing. Yeah. Uh, so that's oftentimes why maybe people move around without really explaining what's going on. And sometimes moving around and getting more color on there will help you solve the problem just by virtue of like, oh, with this up here now, this is really bright and I want this to be brighter than that. So I think my correction for that down there at being kind of, you know, not, not super smooth was to just like, let me glaze over dark colors over all of it so it is darker and then it kind of fades it away okay done yeah but you didn't know that until you got more paint on there so yeah yeah it, when i first was new to painting i just felt like every single thing i did needed to be 100 percent done before i moved onto the shoulder pad and then moved onto the sword and then moved forever it's like oh no you're just creating more frustration and spending more time because you don't have the full access to all the information you're going to need to make those final decisions yeah yes Absolutely. The one last thing I want to say is about decals. I learned about when making custom decals uh, on the first Inquisitor. Um, so when you buy a decal, the decal is cut out perfectly around the design. Um, and that's very important uh, because with a custom decal, you have to do the cutting yourself. And if I have a circular object and I try to cut out around it with an exacto knife, I'm not going to get a perfect circle. It's going to be a little bit like an octagon, right? A little angular. Yeah. Especially if it's smaller. If it's smaller, that's going to be a hexagon. It's going to be even smaller. Um, and when you have those corners, and they're not going to be perfect corners, they're going to look kind of jaggedy and bad, and you smack the decal down and you do the varnish on top of it, you, there's a chance you might see those edges, right? Mm -hmm. And so on my Grand Inquisitor, you can see the edges on the back of the cape on one side of the decal. And so for these ones, I was like, how am I going to fix this? I took these nail scissors that have like a little bit of a curve in them, and holding the this tiny little Imperial logo with the tweezers, I, cu I cut around the decal so I had a perfect circle. And then that's what I did for all of these ones. And then with that, uh, with plus decal setter and like a layer, one layer of varnish, they completely blended into the surface. So I was surprised. I didn't need to do anything really extra to get that to work out so well. So if you do custom decals, try to cut the decal out as closely as possible to the actual design. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes it a lot easier to hide. It reminds me that I just purchased for the first time in my life bottles of Microsol and Microsec. Oh I've, yeah, I've never done a decal in my life. Yeah, honestly, it's it's one of those great speed painting tips. It's like it's so simple and it adds so much for just so little. Yeah, so I need to do it. I think going over to what I painted for my Blood Ravens here, I think I'm gonna put the decals on their shoulder pads nice. and then probably go back over and do a little kind of like hatches and scratches to you know blend them in. But I am 
nervous that I'm going to fuck that up so bad. I just, luckily there's some great resources out there. I'm sure there's a Vinci V video and exactly <laughs> how, to, how, to, how to do the decals correctly. You're not going to mess it up. I mean, I don't know about that, but I, I'm very concerned about the edges being seen. Like, that's the big thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think especially with the pre-made ones from GW, they're super, th- I mean, I don't know I don't know how thin they are. One thing people compare with decals is how thin is the actual sticker because um, that makes it obviously easier to blend into a surface. Oh, if it's sure, thinner. sure. Um, but I think, I think you'll be good. Okay. You'll be good. Is, uh, found out that it's really hard to find Blood Raven is it? decals because they're not, like, included in anything, and it was, like, one box set included them. Luckily, I was hanging out on, after this video came out, I was hanging out on uh, Sam Lenz's stream, and one of the viewers there was like, did you need Blood Raven decals? And I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> and he was like, I'm going to Dragonfall this weekend, and uh, Sam's going to be there. I'll just give the sheet to Sam, and then you're going to see him at VincyCon. Mm. And I'm like, this is the stars aligning, my friend. Thank you. So I'm going to eventually have those, and then I'll be able to put on my decals. So... Um, what I painted was more Space Marines. Um, I talked a little bit about these guys last uh, last episode of my plan. And, of fucking course, the goddamn... I can't get magnets to stick without freaking oh. breaking them out. It's not your fault. I think the problem is the they're really strong magnets. And even putting them down... I try them with just hot glue first. Is that hot glue? It's hot glue around it. And then they popped off. So then I put super glue... Between the hot glue and the base, and super glue between the hot glue and the magnet, and I think they're just too strong. They're also because they're flush to the surface they're sitting on. It's very the, strong. This connection is really strong. Or like this one, uh, Derek already had a magnet on it, and it's not flush, and it just can sit there. Yeah. Also, there's not a great place to put a magnet. It's a bunch of like text and letters and stuff, and you yeah. wouldn't get you wouldn't get like a, a decent amount of contact. Yeah. So. Because these are not as thick as the full width of a base, I'm probably just going to go back through and put them on, um, put those magnets on so they're not flush, and then hopefully that works. So, yeah, these guys were my uh, painting up a kill team. So the cool thing I found out is there's seven guys here, but you only have six in a kill team, so I have a little bit of flexibility. When you found that out, we were like, Fuck, I painted one more than I needed to. No, I was I was fairly sure, because I wasn't 100% sure, but I was fairly sure I could only use six. But I'm like, each of these are a different loadout. And so I'm like, well, that's okay. What's one more? You know, what's seven over six? It still took me, you know, a fair bit of time regardless. I didn't feel like I what do you What do you think? Is this like two hours a dude, three hours a dude? Uh, it took me about... 20 hours i think for little, the whole thing little under three yeah a little under three a, three a dude what's well, hard to know because like what's what's his three hours a mini he's probably not thinking about like airbrushing and like cleaning the airbrush and all that shit like i explicitly timed my active oh, yeah but if, if you just time like how long took you to do the whole project then it's not not considering that of the i would say it was about two and a half working days a day and a half of it was just painting the red armor yeah wow because wow and i don't even think that i did it amazingly but i think that it was like figuring out placement building up three levels of highlight being really careful about not putting up too much of that orangish red for highlights so it read as red instead of reading as um orange you know what i mean it read as red but not red as orange yeah red is red 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 orange red red orange red 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 (laughs) it's tough to highlight up red I also realized I did make a mistake with the lighting, and I was just... Um, you did? The light on the backpacks. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, the backpacks, there should be... Uh, just never said it to anyone. Yeah, there should be highlights on the inside of the backpacks, because that's where the light's coming from. I just have it on the outside. Yeah. And I like realized it... It's not that big of a deal. You no, know, I realized it like halfway through, and I'm like, oh, fuck this. I'm not going to go back through and like build up highlights on that inside again. Fuck it. Um, oh, because they are on the backside of the backpack. Yeah, and there should be some highlight back there, but there should be more on the front-facing side. On the plus side, it kind of creates the halo of darkness around the lighter head. The halo of darkness. <laughs> That's a sweet band name. <laughs> halo of darkness. No. Yeah. Second magnet down. I'm yeah. going to stop touching these models. Oh, you can just pick up the whole sheet and look at them like that. Oh, yeah, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, I don't I don't care. So, um, 
Yeah, so there was a bunch of phoning in that went in on like all the highlighting of the black guns and stuff and the highlighting of the metallics. It was just real simplistic. I wanted to find the shapes, but I can't I, I I'm so frustrated with how many freaking edges and angles there are on every rifle in 40k <laughs> and i get it they look awesome because of that i fully accept that that just means that they suck to paint um especially if you're like oh, i'm gonna do this little part gonna be silver and then this little part's gonna be black and then this little insignia on it i'm gonna do uh, that gold and it's like oh great you can spend four hours painting one stupid rifle and you got a whole squad or an army full of these little rifles and it's just a it's uh, it's a lot of work when you don't want to full ball sack it. Yeah, and honestly, what's what's so hard about painting the red armor? So that was the longest part of your paint plan, painting the red yeah. armor, and you could have spent longer doing that. Oh yeah. And so like, and you, you need to make a choice at some point where it's like, where am I, where am I going to stop painting? And it's not it's not easy. You could like you could do a few more edges, a few more highlights, and then it would take. 15 more minutes, 20 more minutes. You could do it for another hour. You could do it for 30 minutes less and it would look a little bit a little, little bit worse. And so it's like, you got to find this like spot where it's like, no, this is the amount of time for the outcome that I want that I'm going to stop. And it's just like, it's yeah. so hard for me to figure that area out. It's like, how do you figure that out? Yeah. I actually think that there was a, a, a way of doing this that would have given me a better final outcome, but I chose not to because I think it's less accessible. And that would be to really over exaggerate the highlights um make them even more punchy and probably go more towards pink in the highlight spectrum than the orange and then go back through an airbrush in a vibrant red ink over the top of everything and so i'd have a much more punchy vibrant every bit of those highlights that would stand out the table a little bit more um but it's it's also a more complicated approach um, not just, well, you need to have an airbrush to do this stuff. It's not just that. It's also how much more you are going to over-exaggerate those steps, and they look like garbo in the meantime until you kind of pull them all back together. Um, whereas this was just like sitting down with a paintbrush and just working up layers and under understanding um, where you wanted to do that. So, What was your, what was your arm joint? leg joint policy here and this inner tube stuff because some of it you painted and some of it was not painted if i saw it i painted it if <laughs> okay. i didn't if i forgot <laughs> okay, i didn't okay. see it did i miss some uh yeah yeah the leader's uh extended arm with his pistol is, <laughs> it's not black at all is it uh there's there's and also there's some smaller areas that are harder to access but that was the one i noticed the most was just that one <laughs> yeah it's just you paint seven dudes you just miss stuff <laughs> i mean like i don't know i have a stays red who cares it's like not the thing I'm looking at. I'm looking at the shoulder pads and the red armor. Yeah. Oh man, it's so nice when you you get a nice edge highlight on the outside of the rim of the shoulder pad and the inside, and they're both parallel. Yeah. Ooh, that inside edge is a fucking bitch, though. I know. Uh, I know. And then actually trying to like freehand a bit of a line on the shoulder pad itself. Forget about it. Of dude. that little thing, I did a bit of that, but it's fairly faint. And I actually I'm kind of pissed at myself. I didn't use a more bright color because i did the fucking work and you just it's harder to see and no one got time for that yeah yeah i was like that's that's one of those things where it's like okay i don't really want to do this i don't think it's really going to be noticeable but do i have the energy right now to just put in the fucking reps right i'm gonna i'm doing this because it's helping me long term as a painter be able to work with drawing straight lines when there's not a shape that i use as a crutch and I, it was probably didn't really show, but I was like, okay, I feel like now when I did that, I'm like, I don't think I could pull this off the way I did a year ago or two years ago. I think like my brush control is notably gone up. And so it was, if nothing else, it was like, okay, I feel like I've improved. And sometimes when you get to a certain part of, of the level of your painting, like it's harder to see those improvements. That's why people often say I've plateaued, I've plateaued. I'm like, you haven't plateaued. It's just harder to see where your improvements are and those improvements are smaller. And you need to celebrate those more because you're not going to get those big jumps anymore. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you get to a point where you may never get another big jump or your next big jump is going to require a lot more hours and a lot more little steps to get to that next big jump. And that's just that's just how everything works, not just miniature painting, 
you know it's getting good at anything you get to a point where to get to the next level is way more hours and way more you know uh expertise needed to get to that next step so a diminishing return absolutely that's the term and then the final thing i painted was another space marine where i took a a model painted by my buddy derek well, it was one of the first models he ever painted and i for dark angels and i just painted on top of it <laughs> i did not strip it i did not worry about uh rebase coating everything i did not re rebase coat anything all i did was i looked at the color looked at my shelf found a color i thought was pretty close cleaned up the stuff because you know a lot of crappy paint jobs you get on ebay things or used lots or your original models that when you first started painting um a lot of those it's just a matter of cleanliness so i just did a lot of cleanup um and then using the magic of uh, a black wash over everything it pulls it all together and then just did a couple of build up select highlights and uh called him done I mean, like I, I for like his silver and his gold. Other than cleaning them up and throwing a wash on them, I didn't do anything with them. I didn't go back and do more work. I didn't do any other highlights. I'm like, I'm just gonna spend a little more time on the helmet and on his green armor and everything else. I also based it because it was like usual. You see people with their beginning paint jobs or stuff you buy on eBay, and like they just don't have any anything on the base at all. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I didn't prime the base stuff. It was like resin and shit. I was like, I'll just throw the base color on it. Just painted it. Just paint it. Just paint. So I think it's a pretty impressive effect. I think it's a cool idea for a video. I think it's a, this is going to mean a lot to a lot of people. They're going to really appreciate uh, this idea that, like, we were discussing this before, though. And sometimes when there's, when you have a difficult situation, if there, if you have a way to mentally carpen, uh, I can't say this word, compartmentalize mm -hmm. that uh, difficult situation, so that you can just give it a status then forget about it it makes it easier to deal with so an example of this that's not mentor pain related is that like i had to make a tough choice about like a video that i had to make and i asked the question to someone else to answer it who i knew was going to answer in a, in a certain way and because of that i was able to like remove any responsibility that i felt like i had in coming up with a choice mm -hmm. and so for me Stripping for a lot of people is just like, uh, maybe I can fix this with painting. I don't know. But instead of making that difficult choice and going through that effort, I'm just going to strip it because then I'm, I'm going to start from bare plastic or close to it, which I know I can do and I am comfortable with. Or at the very least, that is the normal route for most painters, starting from bare plastic. And so I feel like this can, this, I, this uh, example can really combat that. If you understand what you're trying to fix, you don't need to strip the stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's a great amount of lesson to be learned in terms of you being able to improve as a painter and problem solve by putting yourself in a situation where I don't know how to fix it and just yes. start putting pushing paint around and you'll realize that it's not as complex. And you're also then assuming if you strip the model and start from scratch, you're not going to end up in a very similar situation where you also don't know what you're going to do next. Or right. You need to, to solve problems it. at some point, yes, right? You're going to. This is just like going about it in a way that we in our typical mini painting process we don't do i also found it was really enjoyable and freeing to do it off of somebody else's base paint job because i didn't have any emotional connection or i didn't understand the decision making of why he did what why he put stuff where any of that i didn't know what paints he used i didn't know any of that i'm like i'm looking at this completely separated from any of that emotional attachment or decision making i am just looking at it analytically and how can i approach this what's the best way for me to spend as little time as possible to make it look as good as possible and in this process i realized how much fucking time we spend painting models doing those first steps that even if painted shittily someone's done hours of work for you <laughs> like it, it was crazy there's like no i can just get right into the stuff that that makes a difference because the base coats are there. Yeah. They may not be clean, but it takes me 10 minutes to clean up that green in 10 minutes to do the, clean up all the other colors. Okay. I spent 15 ish minutes to clean it up. And now I just get to work Yeah, as opposed to two hours of base coating everything. 
You know, it's like that's not nothing. No, and th- there's this British painter I follow on Instagram. He's like he paints like really awesome Space Marines. So uh, he's also he's, like, he's he's super nice too. And he put on his Instagram. He's like, is anyone available as a commission to do the base coats for my Space Marine army? And I was like genius yeah, like, was, that's fucking genius and he was like i ain't got time for that and i was like holy cow so yeah hearing that reinforces uh that that discovery he made um but yeah it just takes a while well yeah and like the first if you think about it the first 50 ish percent of any paint job the bar of level of quality you need to have to do that first 50 percent is so much lower Yes. And you can screw up a lot of stuff there. That's the other thing I learned with this is like there's a lot of things that can be screwed up in that first 50 percent and you are fine. Yeah. And I look at random models you buy on eBay, big lots of used models you get at your local store, you know, the early models that you partially painted or you just slapped colors on them. Just look at them as someone already put in the first hour to two hours on the model. Look at it that way instead of a shitty paint job. And then you'll realize, oh, I can just jump into the stuff that will give me the version, the final version of this product equating to my current skill level. Is he going to give you, are you going to give him the mile back? No. <laughs> well, here's what I did. This is Blair? No, this is Derek. Hey, fuck Derek. He's a, he's a local dude. All he's, your model art belong to John now. The rest of the models, because he gave me a total of six of them, and I you know, showed them on the video, and I picked which one I was going to paint. The rest of them I'm giving back. But I also... Oh, oh, oh how gracious of yeah, you. I'm, 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 I'm giving back your shitty painted models, Derek. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the other thing, what I did was, though, in my defense, in this Warhammer Heroes box, it comes with eight models. One of them's a duplicate. I gave him the eighth one that was a duplicate. You gave him a I duplicate gave him a space, space marine? I gave him a space marine for his space Oh, my marine. God. How many does that leave you with? 3,000? Yeah. <laughs> You're so kind. Oh, my God. Yeah, I gave him a Space Marine for Space Marine. <laughs> this is a one-to-one transaction. I'm, ca- I'm calling you out, bro. You have 3,000 Space Marines. That means nothing to you. Yeah, what is another Space Marine? <laughs> yeah. I would, yeah, I can give him a box of Space Marines, and I'd never miss it. <laughs> yeah, truly. Uh, wow, it's been an hour, and we haven't gotten to the main topic That's yet. okay, because they might be... They might be uh, it might be shorter ones because today we've got a couple of shorter questions, three three shorter questions to be exact, that we're going to discuss. Um, and I don't think Scott's even looked at them yet, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> but before that, let's do a brief message from our sponsor. John from home here to tell you about today's sponsor, Gamers Grass, and their new line of battle-ready bases called the Deserts of Mahel. What the Mahel? Now we all know Gamers Grass has awesome tufts and basing bits, but the Battle Ready bases really get us a great looking model on the table in next to no time. Just paint the model and put it on. Each base comes pre-painted and is uniquely detailed from the others in the package, keeping them visually interesting, but your squad gets to keep that cohesive look you've worked so hard for. All you have to do is glue them down and they're ready for tabletop or display. And in select lines, they've added a place for magnets right into the casting. What I've always enjoyed about Gamer's Grass is their wide variety in their different product lines. So whether I need to do an alien infestation base or an urban rubble base, they seem to have me covered. And look, we all know what it takes to paint a boring sand motif, but with Deserts of Mahel, you get a nice variety and depth of color in these bases so they really look like they punched up a notch on the table. The light tan of the sculpted dunes, the ochre of the dust, the light brown of the mud cracks all flow really beautifully together. But it's these really simply placed dark brown spots that insinuate parts of this desert aren't quite dry yet. And that's what really makes it believable that this desert is a living, changing place. So whether you're in the market for a wide variety of colors and sizes of grass tufts, some battle-ready basing bits, or the battle-ready bases themselves, Gamers Grass is going to get you where you need to go. A big thank you to Gamers Grass and their Deserts of Mahel battle-ready bases for sponsoring today's episode. We'll have links down in the video description and the show notes for you to go get yours today. All right, first question of the day comes from Ched Cheeseman. I am assuming Ched Cheeseman is his uh, legal name from birth. Uh, I also made the bold assumption that Ched is a male and maybe... Ched is not a male, so I'm sorry, Ched. Ched. Um, the question from Ched is, when I was at music college, okay, bud. Yeah, okay, bud. Okay, bud. When I was at music college, 
I was once told practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. How do we practice perfect in the mini painting hobby? How do we practice perfect in the mini painting hobby? Is it a valid question to ask what is perfect practice? That's where I want to start. But then again, right. 10 minutes, is that a lot for that kind of question? I don't know. All right. Okay. So here's my thought. When I try to think about it from the perspective of where he's coming from, um, from music. So anytime you sit down and play guitar at all, you are becoming more proficient just by going through the act. But perfect practice means you take a piece of sheet music and you try to nail every note exactly. You are very focused. You're adding um, emotion. You are using your, your own style, starting to implement your own style, your own take on things. So I look at it as like full commitment, a.k.a. full ball sack. To me, this answer comes back to full ball sack. When I say, when I hear perfect practice, that means I am painting as best as I can when I sit down to practice perfect. It means I am not rushing through any part of it. I am trying to make sure every blend is smooth. I'm trying to make sure that every edge highlight is not only there, but is equal thickness. That means that I am going through when I'm working on the tiny little details on the face that I am fixing any mistake. I'm not letting anything um, go unseen and undone. And that means when I do that, it's going to take me a lot longer um, to get to my best level. Your, your perfect practice will always take you twice as long as your 75% effort. It should take you a lot longer. And that means maybe it's not the entire model. Maybe your perfect practice is just for the face of this model. I am going to practice to do it the best version of a face. I want this to be the best face I've ever painted. And that perfect practice is what will actually get you leveling up to become perfect. Perfect is not a real thing, but sure. Yeah. I I can't think of a different way to interpret perfect practice other than, yeah, you are trying to constantly operate in a world where you are like out of your comfort zone a little bit. And when you're always operating in that world, it can be a little bit much if you do that all the time, but like that's how you improve. Um, and then the other sentiment is practice makes permanent. I think what that is trying to say is when you practice often, the skill becomes, is it trying to say literally permanent? So that if you were to say to stop for a month and come back, there'd be a certain level of skill that would just not go away because Correct. you have a permanent like memory of those, like those muscle memories and stuff like that. Yeah. It becomes the subconscious. Right. And so right. there are times when like I will not paint for probably two weeks straight and then kind of get back to it. And it feels a little awkward at first, but it is definitely like riding a bike. Um, it's really easy to get back into. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. It's like if you won't think about how to make a G chord. If you've practiced enough, you just know what a G chord is. You don't have to think about it. It's the same thing with like, um, what is the consistency of paint and how much paint is on my brush when I do an edge highlight? When you practice enough, you won't have to think about what that is. You'll go it. You'll do it by feel, and your brain will be thinking about something else, whether it's the podcast you're listening to, or whether it's what color should I end up painting the eye lenses on the Space Marines helmet. And while you're doing that, you are going through the motions to get the perfect paint consistency and wiping it off the right amount and then starting the edge highlight because you're not actively thinking about that. That is what's practice. Practice perfect means that you are making sure at every little thing in your uncomfortable zone that just outside of what your reach is, maybe it's just a little better than your typical painting is to try to reach that. You're really cognizant and really pushing for that each time. Yeah. And I don't necessarily know if it's like, if it has to be like you're painting to the best of your abilities. I think it's if you're doing something that you're not familiar with, right? Because, like, for instance, I am bad at, or like when I was painting my Chalnath box, I was bad at speed painting squads. And to some degree, I still kind of am. But I was trying to figure out a way to make that better for me and more enjoyable. I was intentionally pulling back on my skill to get a result somewhere in the middle that I was happy with that didn't take a lot of time. That was like an intentional thing that I was trying to do to see what the outcome was. And then based on what the outcome was, I'm going to change my like behavior going forward. Do you think that counts as perfect practice as well? Or is it really only 
the the technical proficiency. I mean, even that's technical profession, proficiency. It's speed yeah. versus quality. So how does that fit into your definition of perfect practice? That's good. That's a good question. Um, I think it can be just a certain technique. I think it can be a certain approach. I think you trying to do the best version of or a more improved version of speed painting is perfect practice because you have a goal in mind of something you're trying to achieve. And one of the factors in that is time. Okay. And so, okay. So for me, my perfect practice is not when I'm sitting down at a stream and painting a Greyjoy character. That for me is just, I'm going to use all the prior knowledge that I've already accumulated. I'm not going to think at all. I'm just going to, maybe I do a baby little experiment, but otherwise I'm not practicing perfectly. I'm just getting reps in. Yeah. One thing to keep in mind too is that practice perfect does not mean you're only doing the things you already know. I think trying something new or experimenting when you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but you know you need to put in reps. Perfect practice in painting NMM when you don't have a lot of experience or you don't know what to do includes getting reference photos, looking at other people's work that do it really, really well, diagnosing why it worked, trying to figure out how did they achieve that or based on how I know paint works uh, or how I paint my own models, how could I try that? And then you actively try to replicate or you try to interpret. You take pictures of your model under a harsh light and see how hard that light reacts under a glossy primer. It is not just sitting down and be like, oh, I think I'm going to do NMM on this sword today. And you just pick out a couple colors and you start going. That's not perfect practice because you've not set yourself up to actually try to achieve something better than your your norm your norm okay so perfect practice could, could describe like striving for an improvement yeah okay so i i think that that is something that i th i kind of thought and i'm interested in what the goody peepees think if you're watching on youtube put down in the comments below how many of you in your average painting so i would say you know for most of us 50 to 75 percent of our painting is just like sitting down and just painting the thing and um having a good time with it how many people do you try new things while you're doing that kind of painting do you do that all the time me too I, there's not a mini that goes by that i am 100 percent confident of the next step for every step yeah i would say that when i was batch painting i was with like the 10 man uh, unit for my soul by army that was probably more of the same. But even then, I was trying different things like painting stripes on their chest, mm -hmm. painting their jaws like golden. So I was still, but like that was about le less of that in that 10-man unit. But in the batch painting, I'm, I would guess that you have things that you were trying to get the best version of them that you could replicate in the batch version. So how do I get the most vibrant red? Yes. And that was like, you didn't 100% know. I kind of did because I did it on the skeletons already. Uh, but there's still other things with, yeah. with that, like the oil washing and all that shit. Yeah. So I think I was surprised to learn that not everyone works that way. Oh, well, I mean, um, yeah, of course. Why not? I don't I don't know what the the breakdown is. My my uh, challenge would be for the goody peepees is to find something. If you find that you don't experiment a lot, find something in every mini you paint that makes you uncomfortable. You're not sure how to approach. It could be even just a tiny, tiny thing like the, like the, the purity, the purity seals. Yeah, just perfect. Perfect example. You can just try something a little bit different, experiment with something. It doesn't need to be groundbreaking or whatever. If you find you're already doing that, acknowledge that and celebrate that for yourself because know that that is doing good work for you long term. Even if that one experiment or that one test did not turn out, you went through the process and it's showing you're not having fear of that and that will pay off long term. I got, I got a challenge for you for purity seals. If you don't use matte paint normally, paint a purity seal with matte paint and then... Uh, uh, do glazing glaze on that paint that parchment to get just little shadows under each of the folds of the parchment a little brown color a little yellow brown color glaze it in with a matte paint as a base coat and just try that out no what happens no poopy brown a little poopy brown i mean really if you really got to go and there's no tp in the field purity seal is first thing i'm reaching for absolutely and then that's you probably it. like super heretical yeah you probably just like stick it back on there hope no 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 one notices it's dirt bro be like <laughs> this is the 41st millennia this is grim dark poop on purity seals definitely counts okay. sergeant scott why do you smell like doo-doo <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, we're fighting here in the orc pits. They're covered in shit. I'm covered in shit. Yeah, this is that's totally orc shit. Not my purity seals, not mine. <laughs> Officer, do uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sergeant Scott. Do did the orcs eat corn? Because uh, <laughs> oh, no. I don't, I don't think orcs. Eat I corn. had elotes for for dinner, private, <laughs> and it's just like a, a time skip back on the fucking Thunderhawk ride over there, and you everyone's eating corn on the cob. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's on the fucking cruiser up in space at, at mess hall eating corn in the cob. <laughs> They're all fucking space marines. They eat 30 cobs of space marine. <laughs> They just put it in. There's like a cartoon. They put it in their mouth. Like, <laughs> they eat the whole thing. No, then they just pull, pull it, out, like, it out like the cartoon fish. Where like in cartoons when someone eats a, uh, a, a, a cat eats a fish, they yeah. put the whole fish yeah. in. They pull it out and all the bones come out. I kind of like the idea that I'm just fucking biting it like a cucumber. <laughs> you know, just eat the whole thing, husk it all. Oh yeah, because real real marines they eat. Crayon, so it only makes sense <laughs> yeah, that they definitely space eat marines <laughs> eat full corn on the ground. Right, dude, yeah. their fiber intake is through the roof. Yeah, dude, I can't imagine what their shits look you're, like. You're <laughs> gonna need some purity seals to wipe <laughs> after all that that yeah, fibrous dude. corn cobs. There might, there might be more than just corn kernels on the, the parchment. <laughs> it's just a whole corn cob. <laughs> so much shrapnel, dude. Oh, I cannot imagine. Which leads us to our second topic <laughs> question of the day. You want to read this one? Yeah. What are the steps someone should take in going from painting for tabletop to painting for competition? And what ways can or should they cut their teeth with competition painting before jumping into larger, more professional competitions that attract top painters like Golden Demon, Crystal Brush, have? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. I got you. Anon. Um, okay. Great question. I, uh, I purposely moved this one behind the first one because originally this one was first and I moved this one second because I thought... We could springboard a little bit off of what we just discussed. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, one of his questions was, how do you uh, like set yourself up for greatness? How do you cut your teeth before doing that? And I would say a great way to do that is with an online competition. Um, I've done several of them, maybe like three or four. They do them on uh, the uh, mini painting subreddit very often. Mm -hmm. And I bet they do it on like the 40K subreddit and the Warhammer subreddit. Um, so I'll check out those places. I think a great way to cut your teeth is with an online painting competition, maybe one that's not super popular. Um, like I know Evier Metal does an online competition, but I, I don't think you would find the level of skill <laughs> very fun because uh, they all paint very well and they're all painting in GW style. It's like it's like Golden Demon, but the online version. Um, so I wouldn't I'd avoid that one, but like one that's you know got maybe like 30 entrants to 10 entrants somewhere in there online competition great way to start uh, uh practicing or working it out yeah and how do you go about what does the process look like i think that was the first part of his question what does the process look like for um painting for a competition if you've never done it before i just think about it is just like well however long that you typically take to paint a model at least double that at least double at that. least double that so your whole goal here is to say what i tell myself if i'm painting for competition if i'm going to put in the effort and the time for it i want this to be the best thing i've ever painted now that it may or may not end up being that but if you go into it with that mindset i think the the speed the workflow all of that will then follow suit so you don't rush over the small things. You don't try to just get through this back part of the model because no one's going to look at it. You, Every little thing, you're just like, I'm going to have to put this in, put in my time. And because of that, you need to be able to give yourself time and make it a priority to work on it on a regular basis, knowing that that can kind of grind you down. If you're like, well, I'm just going to spend like 10 hours painting on Saturday. So when it competition on Monday, I'll be able to upload my pictures. I'm like, that's not setting yourself up for success. Because when I find when I'm painting my hardest, it's hard to paint for that long. Even if I've set up a day to do it, it's hard because that style of painting where you are just very detail oriented, very focused, working on the minuscule things, that's rough to do. In an ideal world, you're spending one to two hours a night on it, and then you'll be drained enough after that. Um, and then when should you... What was the last thing I wanted to talk about with this one? Um, what ways should you cut your teeth with competition painting before jumping into larger, more professional ones? Um, so yeah, you talked about online one. That's a good one. Also, there's a lot of smaller conventions. Um, 
gaming conventions are all over the place and you might have to do a little digging join some local gaming facebook groups and that kind of stuff you will find stuff um locally at least especially here in the u.s and i know like in the uk and and australia as well that there's a fair number of them that are uh, are tied in with gaming events especially yeah um there was one for u.s nationals at the song there was a best painted unit uh which counted single figure best painted army all that kind of stuff yeah we had a uh, talking about uh, Derek, who apparently I stole his Space Marine. Um, he ran a small 40K tournament uh, two weekends ago at our local store. Um, not a GW store, just our local game store. And he had, I think, like about a dozen people that were there that were in the tournament. And he had uh, awards for Best Painted Army. Um, I did all that. I came in and I judged that for him. And then they also had a separate painting competition for just a single model. You didn't have to be a part of the tournament to enter. Um, you, or you could have one of your models from your army entered. And then that was a separate small painting thing. So smaller competitions are around or smaller conventions are around. Just try to find one of those. I think that in-person one um, will give you an extra set of juice too it's just like seeing other people's stuff in person kind yeah. of going through getting the, the feedback hopefully getting a sheet of paper with their things that the judges tell you to work on that's important that, actually you know? let, let me amend my suggestion you should find a competition that offers feedback yeah whether it's online or in person um because that that is definitely going to help a lot especially if you're the kind of painter who like doesn't paint with other people you know you don't like have that kind of like back and forth about like what well, we tried this we tried that to have someone who supposedly is a little bit better at painting, judging, hopefully, uh, giving you feedback, uh, that's that, that'd that be great for you, I think. And I think being proactive about getting that feedback after having put so much into it, and you really will learn where your strengths and where your weaknesses are when you paint for a competition. You may not know how good you are or how much room you have to grow on certain areas until you've really... Um, committed to a lot of hours on one piece and now you have this one piece you don't need to just go to that judge go to other local painters or, or people you know that are really good painters painters you look up to people that you respect their work maybe they're um even friends and stuff that like ask them like critique this like where are my areas to improve what did i fall short on what would if you were to make this better what things would you do and when you've put a lot of time into a piece and someone gives you that feedback, it carries so much more weight compared to like, oh, this is my kill team I painted over the weekend and someone gives you feedback. It, it doesn't sink in the same for me. Yeah. You know? So No, it really doesn't. Um, <clears throat> some other advice I'd have about competition painting is I always say something to the effect of play to your strengths. And what does that mean, though, if you've never – competed in uh, a, a miniature painting competition before um there's likely a certain size of miniature that you've painted m the majority of in your painting career like i would say people get this tendency when they want to compete to like do a big and impressive thing and if that means like painting like a model that you've never experienced before or doing a level of conversion or level of painting you've never done before like if like 50 percent of what you're doing is new and different to you you're you're just not going to get as good of a, of a result now that being said say you paint mostly space marine sized figures i would take a space marine sized figure and then try to paint to a level that you've never done before an example of this in my head is the first stormcast eternal you painted mm -hmm. that i could see winning a local competition or placing or doing well it honestly doesn't even matter if it places or not. Like that's the kind of level that I would expect. Uh, so if you if you want to compete, don't don't change up everything that you're comfortable with. Change up some stuff, but not all of it, um, so that you push yourself and improve. But also, there's some chance you'll have a, a certain level of quality for for placing. Because I feel like some measure of success is important, maybe to keep yourself going and motivated. Obviously, winning isn't everything, but like. Some kind of success. And I don't mean like placing, but getting quality feedback, getting a commended entry, getting a People's Choice Award. Like there, there are all types of like um, indicators that like you are you are succeeding and doing well in life. And those are important to kind of help motivation keep keep going. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I think uh, it's important to not like do everything new and unfamiliar for the first time. Yeah. 
And I think this will you if you've never painted for a competition of whatever size before. Um, when we've talked about this before, but I can tell you, or I can give you the advice to like be proud and be happy with what you end up with. But let me tell you something. I don't even need to tell you that because I guarantee you, you will feel that because when you've really put the effort in, you're going to look at that final thing. You're like, wow, like that's better than anything I've painted before. It may not be great. It may not be perfect, but for you, it was better. And that feeling will really be, make you feel worth it. And you'll want to strive to the next thing. So just finding some place for you to go through that experience, I think is, is really valuable. Even if you don't think of yourself as a quote unquote competition painter. Yeah. So. Also that the, the, the devil side is a uh, double edged sword of that is that you become very invested in that piece as well. And you will probably rate it higher just because you invested that time. Mm. And what this, what this means is you might think that your thing is better than someone else's. And then when you lose, you get upset. Um, so I, what I want to say is be aware of that and try to avoid it. But I, I almost feel like I'm just setting, setting you up for even more like disappointment. Cause like, it's, it's almost like impossible to avoid that, you know, like it just, it's just a feeling that you have to go through it in, in a way. Um, cool. All right. Thank you. Anon. If that is your real name. <laughs> um, we got one more rapid fire topics for today. And this one comes to us from Dan Butler. What is the easiest way to approach color theory? You know, with the color wheel and all as a beginner. That was in parentheses, and I just like, yeah. didn't know how to read it. Okay. Let's try that again. What is the easiest <laughs> way to approach color theory as a beginner? You know, with the color wheel and all. I often cling to, on to specific colors because I have, a pretty, I have a pretty good idea on how the different colors work together. But what's your view on this? I think the greatest place to start with color theory is just the terms, the verbs. Mm -hmm. What does hue mean? What does saturation mean? What does value slash... Uh, light mean uh, like what what are those what do those ter terms mean and when I change them when I modulate them how does that change the color like what does it really mean to reduce the saturation of a color well it means to mix gray into it what does it mean to increase the brightness or value of a color you know, it means to mix white into it like, how is that different with paint versus with light I mean I don't know if that's worth thinking about honestly because uh, we don't really care about light. Oh, well, we do care about light because we're imitating light. So how is that different with light versus how it's different with with uh, actual paint? What and so that, that's where I would start. Like v v vocabulary, what the terms actually mean, uh, how they uh, how it occurs in real life with light, and how it's different with paint. Th that I think that's where I would start. How about you? Where would you start? I think I would probably. Well, the way I did it was. Um, figure out the some real basic ways that colors work together or color schemes. What's an example? So like a complementary colors, okay? I think the very first thing and something that I lean on almost every model is complementary colors. And so that is looking at a color wheel, so it's always helpful to either have, you know, a picture saved on your phone or have a, a visual on your table or something of the color wheel in looking at complementary colors. So those are, you know, colors that are opposite on the color wheel. So red and green, that's why those are Christmas colors because they are complementary, you know. Orange and blue, those work look so well together because they're complementary. Interesting thing, if you look at just about any sports team's colors, whether it's college, high school, professional, whatever, almost all of them are complementary colors. Why? because they look well together. And so whenever I'm making a decision on a model for color, I'm, I'm never worried about color theory when I want to figure out the, the base color of primary color of my model. If I want a purple space marine, I want to paint a purple space marine. But then I use color theory to help me in other future decisions. So maybe then I will paint all of his pouches and his satchels and stuff a more of an ochery brownish yellow color instead of just a true leather brown because that yellow brown yellow is complementary to purple yes and so i just use those colors um so complementary colors would be the great way to start i'd say if nothing else 
have a color wheel, use that to help you make decisions. From there, you can learn about color triads and and, and split complementary uh, and split, analogous yep. and exactly. You you can learn other ones, but that can be an awful lot to think about having to learn all these different terms and then what they mean and then all this um, right away. If you work with complementary right away, you will you'll get a really good feeling, and then you can start to evolve that or look at other ways to to work with it. Yeah. And if you want to use complementary, like John is suggesting, I made a video exactly about that method of using color theory, and it's called "Stop Stop Using Color Theory Like a Dingus." And the idea is that you might paint a model like it's a sports team with yellow and with purple, because those are contrasting hues. But if you paint 50% of the model with yellow and 50% of the model with purple, in my opinion, it looks gaudy and bad. It it, it looks forced. Um, and you might like that. That's totally fine. But the way that John is suggesting thinking about it is that you don't have to use full ass yellow and full ass purple. Maybe the marine is purple and you use the yellow in a more subtle way, like with the color ochre, which is much more muddy and not as bright and saturated um, and kind of almost like kind of piercing as normal yellow can be. And that is a way to use color theory, uh, contrasting color theory um, to like kind of you know, make some choices for you about what colors you should use. Yeah. That's a great way. Like it, it can influence your neutral tones, your grays, your tans, your blacks, your whites, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, another easy one that you can, I think is easy to grasp and people can figure out and implement really well is the monochrome color scheme. So you're using different fun, different shades of red for everything. And that may mean, well, I actually have a little bit of blue on here, but I'm mixing in a regular red that I used for the Space Marines armor to create um, a bit of that feeling of red that's added to a dark blue that I paint his boots with. And so you're adding little bits of red to any other color you use, or you're just using a bunch of different shades of red all across the spectrum to paint the model. Um, those are often feel very harmonious and they're easy for us to grasp without really knowing a ton of color theory. So not monochrome necessarily, but like mother color, is that what you're referring um, to? Well, monochrome would be kind of the way to start where you're just like, I'm just going to grab eight different reds off my wall. You recommend someone paint a monochrome model as like a, a F exploration into color theory? Yeah, because I think it's easy to understand. It's just like, well, I don't have to worry too much about decision making. I'm just going to grab this brick red. I'm going to grab this fire red. I'm going to grab this red orange and I'm going to grab this pink. Right. And I'm going to paint this model all in these colors. And then you can learn about warm and cold. And for the base, you paint the base a cold color because the whole model is now a warm color. And you'll learn how working with warm and cold colors work together. But Permit me to be that guy, but that is not monochrome. Monochrome is I took a red, a black, and a white, and that's all I have. Oh, well. If you, if you want to start sure. messing with color temperature and that stuff, that's something sure. else entirely. You know, that's a different thing you're learning. Sure. I mean, sure. Wait, hold on. You, you totally missed an opportunity here. Wait, where's the... It was here. I don't know. How to... We get this instead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One I was huge right. limitation of this fucking thing, let me rant for a second, is you can't change what hotkeys these pads are once you've started recording. Stupid. Okay, anyways, moving that is, on. That is stupid. I don't know why. Yeah, you're right. I was thinking of a, of a very basic, like, painting in a single color, different variations of that color, which yes, I've... I do that all the time, which I view as monochrome, but I know that's not the actual definition. But that's an easy entry level into color theory as well. Yeah. And then warm and cold. If you're painting a model mostly in warm colors, so it's a lot of those reds and oranges and yellows or whatever, even the reddish purples, violets, is, then you could contrast that greatly for the small bits of cold colors you add, the small bits of green or blue that you have in there. So Yeah. Okay. That's it. Get complimentary colors. That's the answer. Yes. That's that's a great, great stepping stone into the, the world of contrasting hues and color theory. All right. Those were the three rapid fire questions. We have some news items. We also plan to do a food thing. Are we doing the food thing instead of the news? I think that's what we're doing, right? Yes. All right. Snack us up. And while he prepares the snacks, I'm going to check the news that uh, James put together here just to see if there's anything worth chatting about. The top one excited me, but that's it. Okay, so the Corvus Belly shares some deets about the I'm gonna first Warcry battle box. John's going to go pee. Um, there are troops from two nations in this box. Um, and these are actually like... Uh, 
these are factions I've never heard of before in in uh, Infinity. Uh, I don't know how to say this word. It's like it's like hegemony or hegemony, um, a political, economic, and military uh, predominance of one state over the others, like Rome or a League of Corinth. Uh, the hegemony of Embersig. It's a human, a starry elf, and Ghent dwarf cosmopolitan. What the fuck does th- what do these words mean? Okay. That uh, that tells me nothing <laughs> about the faction. I mean, no, it tells me everything, but I'm too stupid to know what it means. Uh, and the other one is the Northern Tribes Alliance of Orcs and Ver- Verank, a Nordic-esque blue-skinned orc beings. Uh, it's still in development, but the official announcement will be uh, it'll be available possibly at Adepticon 2024 or Gen Con. Uh, but this is subject to change, so it may not come out then. So, okay. You are probably seeing the pictures, or at the very least, the links are in the description for these things that I am trying to describe. Okay. All right. I kind of see what's going on here. Wizardy, humany, you know, kind of piratey, kind of like they have like conquistador helmets a little bit. So it's like kind of Spanish, but not really. Um, and then the orcs definitely very Nordic. Yes. Okay. Uh, they have the whole thing going on where like their head is kind of in the middle of their body and like their shoulders are like significantly higher than like where their neck is. Um, kind of like a dreadnought, you know, how, like a dreadnought has like the head in the center of its body. That's what these orcs remind me of right now. Orcs are pretty cool. If you like orcs, you'll like these IMO. Um, but for the other faction, um, I don't know. It looks okay. It looks okay. Do you do you like one of these uh, one of these factions these new factions that Corvus Belli is showing off in in the War Cry? Uh, I the one interesting thing I saw was that like the the concept art and everything I like, thought looked bad, and then when I got to some of the models, I was like the actual sculpts for a lot of these the orcs I don't love, um, but there's there's like a, a le- right level of detail and this feels very cool fantasy to me that I, I i was like wow i just like this like i really want this game to be to be good and for it to be successful yeah because i kind of assume these would also be factions in uh infinity but maybe i'm wrong about that maybe that's maybe this is just for war crow yeah because this is fantasy okay yeah this is not for infinity oh, so man. like that like like that dude it's yeah. kind of a blurry picture, but like that dude is really cool. The dude yeah. with the eye patch, with like the pinstripes to the posing on them, like it, it has the infinity attention to detail on their their um, their sculpts that I just really think is great. Particular factions of these, none of them that are shown in this box like scream to me as like, oh, I would definitely want to play, play that one. But like this uh, Warcaster orc thing, like it's just like a really good sculpt. Yeah, like it feels like you know. I, comparable to GW level of um, of quality of sculpt and final model. Like, I, just, I just was very impressed. I really hope that this game um, works. And, because uh, I, I think it's, I think the models excite me. They also excite me at a level of these would be great for D&D. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe that's part of the reason why I really like them. Nice. Um, okay, let's get to uh, our, our b- bucket of goodies. Alright, yeah. prepare the bucket of goodies while I talk about news that no one cares about. Privateer Press releases a new faction for War Machine. The Underground Dwelling and Draconic Chimera got, has a new star set with 22 models. Okay, so if you're into War Machine or Hordes, you've got a War Machine specifically. What is this, 2007? Wrecked. Shots fired. Shots fired. Uh, GW published an article all about Space Marines. Uh, six parts. A primer, a 101. So if you don't know about Space Marines, uh, you've been living under, living under a rock, apparently, uh, and you can figure that out. And, and he doesn't include this, our writer, because it's uh, news, necessarily, but it's concise for GW, and he wants them to do it for every faction. Uh, so that's a message from our writer to you, GW, if you're listening. Make this article for all your major factions. It'd be cool to get a little primer. All right, let's get on to our Hawaiian back. Do I see salad dressing in there? Yes, you do. What is this podcast to become? Yeah. The, okay, so he threw a little curveball. Kim did. First of all, he wrote us a nice little, nice little note. It's kind of an anniversary, and like, like here, cheers to another year of top and that kind of thing. Even though it's uh, October, but it's 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 a year for him, and so we we really appreciate that. It was really nice, um, and and also in the letter, he gave his Kane's gift card. 
Whoa, you did that last time, too. My boy. So guess what we're going for lunch today, my Canes. friend? We're going to have some chicken tendies on, on Freighter Kim. Um, this one threw us for a little curveball because there's a lot of shit in here that uh, was not expecting. We're going to start with the things that were most likely to be to see coming. First with the chocolate cover macadamia nuts. Now, this is the only thing that's open because my wife and I needed to try one. What so the fuck, Jeff? You can open one now. They, 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 so they're in these little uh, little tray container things, but they just fall all over the place. So yeah, what am I doing? Make sure you touch them all. They're just gonna fall back in there. So as well. So we expect uh, chocolate covered macadamias, right? Um, we also have Island Princess brand macadamia popcorn crunch. Ooh. So it's like uh, what's the name of that stuff? The clusters or. There's the uh, uh, like uh, Cracker Jacks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Cracker Jacks, but it's macadamia nuts instead. Um, so uh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, <laughs> this so is a thing. That's also uh, something that we we would expect. Uh, another thing we'd expect is Hawaiian Paradise Coffee. Oh uh, yes, the coffee. Ho- coffee from Hawaii. Apparently, that's a big thing. It is Hawaiian Kona? coffee blend. Kona coffee is that the word they would use? Oh it? sure, sure. And we're quickly getting into weird shit now. <laughs> okay, we have two different kinds of meat rubs. Oh, I love me a meat rub. See, so we've got Hawaiian smoke, our special Alea barbecue spices with the tangy smoke flavor. Oh. Great rub, seasoning for pork, beef, turkey, and chicken. Is there a Kahlua pork rub? Is the other one Kahlua pork? Uh, no. No? Okay. This one is Ohana Spice Trading Company called Volcanic legend. <laughs> Everyday essentials essentials for flavor filled living. And so this is another spice seasoning and rub. I'm gonna um, eat another one of these nuts. Yeah, eat, you're gonna love my nuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh so we got these, so we're you know, we're gonna uh, eat, obviously we're each gonna get one of these. You know, obviously. obviously we wouldn't be so unjust as to give John two fucking rubs for me. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? <laughs> <laughs> get a rub and a tug. So, <laughs> oh, no. I don't know about you, but I have uh, a tendency to collect so many kinds of rubs in my house. I've got, I probably have like 30. How could you? I, I mean, and mostly because I've got a couple that I really like, but I also like trying out new ones. And then if they're not that good, you're like, God damn it, I got this whole jug of rub, meat rub. Because I'm an, an, an elitist. I, I'm just like, I can make my own rub. <laughs> I don't need to buy pre-made products. It's just a combination of oregano, paprika, and salt. Yeah, but then they always say and spices. And you're like, what is the what? and spices? What's the magic? No, yeah. I, I, I do, do a lot of some too. Like when I do all my Asian uh, cooking, I don't use pre-made stuff. Now, there are some certain things like uh, like gochujang and stuff like that. Like you oh, got to yeah. use the, I'm not making my own goddamn yeah, gochujang. I'm making my own fucking hoisin, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, those those are super valid. And, and all of the barbecue YouTubers that I watch, like they all religiously use like rub mixes. Well, because then they own, they come out with their own. Yeah. That's why. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I've ever watched, especially on shorts. Like all of my shorts on Instagram <laughs> are all fucking dudes making meat. And they're wearing black gloves. Yeah. And they're like, I never get it because they get their hands so nasty with raw meat and then they just grab the spice containers with their raw meat gloved hands like what uh but no yeah a lot of that um next up we've got two different pancake mixes all right freighter chocolate macadamia nut pancake mix and pineapple coconut mac- pancake mix love it um <laughs> you might like this i, I if not was a, we're gonna totally bring this to vincey con and give this as a gift to vince <laughs> Black lava sea salt. Oh, Vince should definitely get. Yeah, all right, Vince, this is coming to you. Yeah, for Vincey Con. Uh, inside inside joke on this, um, but it's also not a joke because it's real. Uh, <laughs> Vince over seasons his food to a lethal level. No, he does not. <laughs> uh, he likes his food salty though, and so he and he has like his special salts that he uses. Yeah, that dude, poor dude's blood pressure. No, <laughs> he said he has low blood pressure, so it's it's fine. So it's all fun and to games. Lethal like, level. Fucking de- he's like dehydrated because all the moisture has been sucked up with the salt in his body. <laughs> so we'll, we'll give that to Vince. Next, we've got here uh, Hawaii's best pineapple dressing and dip. How do we split this? Uh, you chug it and then I chug it. Okay, right now. Yeah, right now. And the last thing in here we're going to do a taste test on right now is Hawaiian Sun Guava Jelly. Okay, I'm excited for this. Okay, now I got here's your spoon. 
Okay. Here's your spoon. Get a spoon. Get this back. Do you want to tre- test this on a butter cracker or a graham cracker? Can I just mainline it? Can I just eat it? Or you want to you want to test it first? Or okay. what should I do? Because I don't want to double dip though. Get a whole bunch, put some on a cracker, and then Sh- suck the rest. Fucking genius. Yeah, that's why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> All right, here, I'll let you take this. Which kind of cracker do you want? You want a graham cracker? You want a butter cracker? You want one of each? I want Grammy Graham. Okay. Oh, you get that seal. nice that nice seal. Okay. Smells? Smells. Here's your gram. <laughs> I just smelled the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> smells like a microphone. It smells like a microphone. It smells it. fruity. So guava jelly. I've never had guava jelly. Have you ever had guava? I think so, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I just fucking broke my cracker. <laughs> oh, no. Am I waiting for you to eat this? Oh, yeah, wait for me. <laughs> I just put the cracker bits in my mouth. Okay, I'm going to definitely, like, spill this everywhere. Let's put it right over the mixer. Yeah. Oh man, this is kind of a, a th- it's a it's a loose jelly. <laughs> a loose jelly. Do All right. Not, do not spill jelly. Okay. Right. Cracker first. I'm gonna I'm just gonna eat it straight first. Yeah, I'm just gonna eat it straight. Huh. What does that taste like? There's a love like it tastes like a, almost like a passion fruit. That's it's very tropical, but it's not overly sweet. Usually with a jelly like this, I'd be like it would be coyingly sweet, and it's it's not too bad. I dig this. There's a little bit of a, a interesting aftertaste to it. It's subtle. Mm-hmm. It isn't like smacking you in the face with a certain kind of fruit flavor. Um, with the gram, it's amazing. Yeah, it is. Um, like if we were up, if we were up like three in the morning, watching YouTube videos and laughing our, our giggly little heads off, we would be downing that whole jar <laughs> for no particular reason. Yeah, we wouldn't completely sober. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta fucking say it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's that's really good though with the cracker. It's very good. Like on toast, I imagine that'd be amazing too. Yeah, it's like did. a really subtle thing. So when you put it with something else, it's also subtle. They kind of like combine together to be like really good. Lid. Because it is, it's a loose, it's a loose jelly. It's not like you know when you get like the smuckers and stuff. You kind of dig in there and it leaves that permanent indent because mm. it's it's like mm. so gelatinous. Yes, yes. The gelatin level in here is is lower, but it's not like super liquidy. It's it's a nice consistency. What if you mix that with that yeasty uh, uh, British slash Australian product? We still have that in the fridge, don't we? Or did you throw that no, away? Oh, it's still there. Actually, people do that. They they will make toast. They'll put Vegemite or fuck, what's that one called? Something Marmite. Marmite on toast with jam. So now we ha- we got it. We have it all. We That's had. just to cover up the taste of <laughs> ass that is Vegemite. <laughs> God damn, that stuff's nasty. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's like, oh, uh, let's cover that up. My review else. of that out of uh, fucking five tendies. How many tendies out of five tendies? Four out of five tendies. Maybe five. Maybe five. Like, I, I, if half tendies, if a half eaten tendie is worth anything, <laughs> I give it four tendies and a half an eaten tendie. Four and a, so you're giving it four and a half tendies. I really like, I think it was good. I really, I really like it too. Now, I will say before I give my score that my mom makes homemade jam. Ooh, the homemade. Like homemade raspberry jam from picked raspberries from her garden and then okay. black cap jam so you're coming from that world that we harvest the black caps from the wild and make my mom makes that jam so i have a high bar a jam and jelly bar to hit yeah. but this in terms of like from a store is really good and the flavor is so cool so i'll give it i'll give it three and a half tendies okay which is pretty high for a high fructose corn syrup based product <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the goodies freighter can we appreciate it Okay, yeah, this is way better than news. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. We appreciate your ear holes. Uh, if you like this podcast enough to support it, there are many ways that you can do that, both free ways and not free ways. Uh, some of the free ways are uh, giving us a like or a review on wherever you listen to podcasts, sharing the podcast with some of your friends that you think may also enjoy it. Uh, you can also watch our podcast on YouTube whitelisted with various browser add-ons. We play an ad every 30 minutes, and watching those ads does give us some kickback. Um, if you have some money to spend, 
We have a Patreon where you can get access to extended episodes of the podcast, 20 to 30 minutes longer. We go over things like our favorite models from other painters that we've enjoyed in the last two weeks, new techniques we've tried out and failed with and succeeded with, and like what where we thought it went right and wrong. Um, we also talk about a, a painter, sorry, a paint job from someone in our community, so in our patrons. We give feedback to them, and also as a patron, you get to give uh, suggestions for topics. So today's topics all came from patrons. So you get to do all that for five bucks a month on our Patreon. Lastly, we have merch on our Teespring store, linked below. Everything's linked below. Um, we have things like sweaters, uh, leggings, not leggings, uh, like sweatpants, T-shirts, coffee mugs, all that stuff with one of our really cool three top logos on there. All right, uh, we will be, be back in a fortnight for the next episode, which will be the best episode ever, even though I don't know what it's going to be, but I make the promise now so we have all the stress to make it a reality. <laughs> and until then, we'll catch you on the flippity flop.